You're listening to Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for firm faith in an anxious age. I'm your host, Colin Hansen. I don't know how exactly to describe Jamie Smith's new book, On the Road with St. Augustine, A Real World Spirituality for Restless Hearts, published by Brazos. I just know I recommend it. Smith himself describes the book as one last take at Christianity for someone tempted to leave the faith behind. Augustine is the guide, so ancient he's strange, so common in his experiences that he feels contemporary. Smith is professor of philosophy at Calvin University and author of many thought-provoking books, and he is himself an excellent guide to Augustine. Yet in this book, he goes beyond telling us about Augustine. Smith uses Augustine to help us answer our deepest questions and satisfy our deepest longings. Smith writes this, Humans are those strange creatures who can never be fully satisfied by anything created, though that never stops us from trying. Smith joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss conversion as compass, authenticity as loneliness, and ambition as bottomless. Thank you for joining me, Jamie. Yeah, it's great to chat with you, Colin. Thanks. Uh, What do you mean when you say we are already Augustinian? We just didn't know it. Yeah, this is one of the kind of subtexts of the book that I, um, it probably is also the most challenging part of the book. There's this fascinating story that um, behind 20th century existentialism, Martin Heidegger, Albert Camus, figures like that, who, who influenced both literature and film and so on. And, and really bequeathed to us this project of finding ourselves, this project of authenticity. It turns out that the backstory to their work is a direct encounter with St. Augustine. So Martin Heidegger's Being in Time, which is, of course, a book that not many people have read, but all of us have been influenced by. Um, it was published in 1928. It turns out, however, that all of the core concepts of that book that had such a uh, was such a bombshell in the 20th century first emerged when Augustine was when, when Heidegger was lecturing on Augustine's Confessions in 1921. So, uh, and and Camus, who who um, uh, people are revisiting today since he wrote a book called The Plague. Um, <laughs> Uh, Camus did his doctoral dissertation on Augustine and Neoplatonism. So there's just this really interesting way in which um, the questions that we've inherited from these kind of trickle-down philosophical effects ultimately track back to Augustine. I think a lot of 20th century folks would be, a lot of contemporary folks would be surprised to know how much they're indebted to the influence of this ancient African doctor of the church. Well, you observe that Augustine associates happiness with rest. It doesn't seem to be what we prioritize so much. We seem to prioritize entertainment or Mm. leisure more so. What's the difference between those two? Rest on the one hand, entertainment and leisure on the other. Yeah, this is where, you know, um, to diagnose our situation, another good Augustinian to help us is Blaise Pascal. So, um, Augustine, like Pascal would say, our culture, one way to diagnose the restlessness of our culture, the fact that we are unsettled and don't know who we are or what we're made for, is um, precisely our incessant penchant for distraction. That is one of the ways we keep trying to entertain ourselves. One of the reasons we keep trying to entertain ourselves is precisely so we can kind of cover over the fact that we don't know who we are or whose we are or what we're about. Uh, So we pursue even our leisure, even our leisure is its own kind of restless pursuit. You know what I mean? Like we're kind of clocking up experiences. We're trying to, to master uh, uh, something. So I, I think, there's a profound unsettledness, alienation, um, anxiety. There's a profound anxiety under our ability, inability to rest. And, and Augustine knew that. I mean, Augustine experienced that for a lot of, you know, first 30 years of his life, which is why then it's so interesting that he identifies um, peace, wholeness 
with actually achieving rest. And and he thinks there's a way in which such rest still eludes us. There's a kind of eschatological characteristic to that. But he also thinks that er, there is a possibility of finding a kind of contentment because we are known. And that seems very relevant. Um, it, it sounds like it could be a hopeful message for today. You've already described a little bit of the origins of our obsession with authenticity and how that has shaped the book. Explain this question you ask. What if authenticity is the source of our loneliness? Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, uh, the, the, the long story here is kind of a, a mashup mixtape of Augustine and Charles Taylor. And what, what's interesting is if you read Augustine today and read him, say, in light of Taylor's diagnosis of our secular age, in which he says one of the big shifts that happened in modernity is we started to imagine that human beings are these buffered selves, as he called them, right? Like we, we – um, that was supposed to promise a kind of security and autonomy for us. So this this notion that I am sort of uh, um, master of my domain, so to speak, I, I'm I'm lord of my uh, uh, castle. Um, that autonomy was supposed to be liberation, but the shadow effect of that so-called liberation that came with autonomy was. Um, we sort of enclosed ourselves uh, in these fortresses of solitude. So yes, I get to decide allegedly who I am and what I'm about and what my good is. But the price is we lose the porosity of our relationality. And so I do think that there's a significant way in which the increase in social isolation and the epidemic of loneliness that we experience in a prosperous late modernity is is the fruit of our misbegotten liberation as autonomous, independent, self-sufficient, you know, world makers. And um, in that sense, the quest for authenticity in which I get to be me, you know, you do you kind of thing is also the recipe for loneliness and isolation. And, and hmm. just also a, a recipe for what I see in young people uh, is um, – a deep existential burden of always having to make it up. And uh, Hmm. there's an exhaustion, I think, that comes with that. Hmm. By the way, you get a lot of extra credit points on the Gospel Bound podcast for multiple references to Seinfeld in one answer (laughs) right there. Fantastic. We we are dating ourselves here, but yeah, okay, that's great. I think think that's just, I think it just goes without saying. (laughs) Do I get points for Big Lebowski references? (laughs) (laughs) Also Big Lebowski, yes, also correct. Um, Many profound insights in this book. We've already heard some of them. Here's another one. You write this. It's precisely when I try to make creation my home, when I disenchant it as an end in itself, that it becomes a foreign country, that distant land of the prodigal's wandering, arid, barren, a region of nothingness, even if it's filled with earthly delights. Tell us a little bit more about Augustine's teaching on disordered loves and how that can help us to navigate this world. Um, Here's another quote from you that I found extremely helpful. You said, disordered love is like falling in love with the boat rather than the destination. I love that. Yeah, and that's that's a common metaphor for Augustine. So this this might be the very heart of Augustine's spirituality, or it's one of the the ventricles of his spirituality, which is um, we will find the joy and rest and peace we are looking for when we learn how to rightly love the right things in the right way. And, And maybe since it's closest to us, that is experienced existentially is fundamentally a question of how do I relate to creation? and its relationship to the creator. And for Augustine, disordered love is when I seize upon and foist infinite expectations on created things as if they could satisfy like the infinite creator. 
Now, one, one of the things I think that is important, and, so, and he thinks that that's just doomed to disappointment. Do you know what I mean? Because um, the infinite hunger I have for meaning and significance and fulfillment could never be returned by finite things. Anything created is finite. Now, I think it's it's really important. This, this is sometimes misunderstood as if Gust, Augustine is suggesting you have to love God instead of creation. And or or love God, hate the world, which is not his point at all. Actually, you have to rightly relate to the gift of creation, so that and and by means of rightly loving the Creator, who is the giver of the gifts of creation. And and what so one way to diagnose again the sort of frenetic anxiety of our late modern secularized culture is um, we we keep seizing upon created things which are good in and of themselves but we keep seizing upon them as if they could be everything whether it's power or sex or money or material possessions or whatever you know none of those things are bad in and of themselves it's if you seize upon them and make them your god if you love them as an end in itself and um and and augustine by the way emphasizes christians are not immune to such temptations right we can still be suckered by that in contrast, rightly ordered love is where once I know to actually, and once by the grace of God, we should say, my loves are rightly ordered to find my end in the Trinitarian creator I know by grace through Christ. Then in a fact, in fact, you get all of creation back as a gift that you hold with an open hand. So you receive it, you even sort of small e enjoy it, you might say, um, because ultimately you are not looking to it for ultimate satisfaction. You are receiving it as a gift from the one who can only ever ultimately satisfy. Does that, does that help? It does. It does. Did, did Augustine leave himself a little bit more open to that critique about loving God and loving the world on, on sex? Or do you think that's an <laughs> yeah, unfair critique I do of think, him? Yeah, it's one of the places where I push back on Augustine in the book is that and and there's there's um probably just a bit of biography that shapes his thinking here right so right. Since, he, since he spent you know 20 years as a playboy uh for him the only way he could imagine rightly ordered relationship to sex is celibacy and i just think that that's um you you could say the protestant reformation was in some ways in that regard uh, uh an augustinian reform of Augustine on that point, because we said, no, 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 even, even our sexual lives can be sanctified as gifts to be received. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a line I liked a lot. You say, conversion is not an arrival at our final destination. It's the acquisition of a compass. How, how do you see that view then reshaping our spiritual priorities? Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd be interested to to see what you um, think of this, because I, I think maybe one of the other ventricles of the heart of Augustine spirituality, I mean, ultimately it's grace all the way down. Yeah. And then to this question, Augustine's what I describe as a spiritual realist. And what that means is um, he is very suspicious of and refuses and actually is not shy to criticize any form of Christianity that pretends to perfection in this life. Mm. And that actually seems like a timely word for us, <laughs> uh, only in be because we, we, even those of us who are Christians are Christians in an age of sort of technocratic solutions where we think anything that's good must be a solution to a problem and that we can overcome it. And I, it's interesting to think how much that seeps into even our spiritual lives. And um, Augustine is just kind of a wide eyed realist about being in Christ is not a solution to everything. Uh, and this is because he has a deep eschatology. And I think this is something that people don't always appreciate about Augustine. There's the reason why it's the acquisition of a compass is because, okay, now I know where home is and I know who's, who's going to receive me there. And I'm confident of that, but I still have many miles to go before I sleep. 
and we pray every day thy kingdom come and it's not here yet and there still are wolves at the door and ditches on the road and uh, augustine you can hear this in his preaching i mean I, one of the things i i hope august people might be pointed to in the book is to discover that we have all these sermons of saint augustine and you hear this deep pastoral realism in his preaching where he's just like meeting people where they are and he says look i know the christian life is hard you know, um and there's no uh shortcuts to arrival there's just the faithfulness of god along the way uh in in being present and forgiving it's one of the reasons why i think confession is at the heart of our liturgical life you know there's or it's it's a key component of our common liturgical life it seems that we have a hard time holding some of those tensions together that Augustine does. And so just as I processed that quote and I thought a little bit about that compass metaphor, it made me think of how especially evangelicals are divided more or less between the kind of holiness tradition as well as the more reformed tradition, but they both seem to struggle in in this respect, the holiness tradition seems to push toward the perfectionism, expecting too much, bit of an over-realized. But then the reform side, there can become a complacency that you see probably characteristically of Baptist, especially that there's a push toward conversion mm. um, in the Baptist tradition or a, a push toward the covenant children, perhaps mm -hmm. another other respect to the reform tradition that doesn't seem to really play out in terms of discipleship. Mm. So perhaps it's under-realized in those ways. So that's why I appreciate yeah. where you're coming from on the Christian realism of Augustine, where there is real progress um, but not quite the same expectations of the perfectionism. Yeah, I, I think one of the other temptations, maybe that's a little more um, endemic to the reform tradition, too, is confusing holiness with legalism. Yeah, because we sort of love law and rule. And so um, and Augustine would be obviously his I think his spiritual realism pushes back on that as well. Oftentimes legalism covers over uh, the grace and mercy of that spiritual realism. Yeah, well, I, I think that's probably both sides of that that's that I described true. there, because when you think about the uh, early fundamentalism of the 20th century, so much of holiness was defined in those externals yeah. um, and then became problematic in terms of its legalism. And we continue to live with that legacy today. And it actually seems to be one way that united the yeah. holiness yes. and the reformed yeah. traditions sure. in that early 20th century of, a, mm. of um, prohibition and things like that. Mm. Um, throughout the book, you're reading on or you're writing on freedom stands mm. out and you write this. If freedom is going to be more than mere freedom freedom from, if freedom is the power of freedom for, then I have to trade autonomy for a different kind of dependence. Coming to the end of myself is the realization that I'm dependent on someone other than myself if I'm going to be truly free. You mentioned earlier, Jamie, that these are temptations for Christians as well. We're not merely talking about the world as if we're diagnosing. But I think that this idea that happiness comes through the proliferation of choices is so deeply ingrained even in Christians that I'm not sure we can even tell the difference yeah. in terms of this kind of freedom versus the kind of freedom that we imagine and enjoy as Americans, or at least as and more broadly as Westerners. So how do we develop a taste for Mm. dependence mm. yeah um i mean sadly i think maybe the gateway to that is experiencing the implosion and crisis of our fabled autonomy right so in in some ways um to be opened up to this alternative vision of freedom as a graced dependence um, you have to experience the failure of the alternative, which is for Augustine just sort of dissolves us. Do you, I mean, you, you just, you think multiplying your options and, and being, uh, um, uh, getting to determine the good is liberating until you sort of live that way for a while and you're liquefied by the experience. And so, um, the, so that's, that would be, I, I think, one way into it, which you wouldn't want to wish on anyone. But I right. do think culturally, I do think culturally, um, we probably 
are going to have to experience that and I think are beginning to. Do you know what I mean? I, I think there are interesting yeah. signals in which people are looking around and saying, there's got to be a better way to be human. Do you know what I mean? Like this, this, yeah. this, this um, liberation feels like a prison. So um, on the other hand, maybe, maybe it's seeing it modeled. So maybe, maybe there's something about um, lives lived in covenant promise where people sort of willingly give themselves over to obligations and expectation, expectations and communities. Yeah. Marriage would be just one little microcosm of this. Marriage is lived well would be one, only one microcosm of this, where then people see what you hope that manifests is a kind of joy and peace and contentment that piques people's interest. And you start to wonder, oh, What's going? What's in that sauce? You know, what's what's happening over there? I'm not sure. Yeah, I I agree on marriage, and I wonder if parenting is a little bit more helpful mm. in this regard because marriage we seem to import so many of these ideas that you're writing against in this book, or that you're helping us to navigate through. It still is very easily about self fulfillment. Yeah. It's still very much about, and then all of a sudden the you realize, wait a minute, happiness comes in the proliferation of choices. Did I make the right choice? Maybe there's a better choice out there. And so a lot of those temptations come in in marriage in a way that it's a little bit harder with kids because yeah. you may have made a decision to have children, but you didn't like choose those yeah. children. So there's yeah. a bit of an objectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you, you have to, um, there's a, there's independence a, independence. Yeah, exactly. And there's, there's a sense in which, um, you, you are now obligated to an other who's other than yes. you and, and yeah. to live into that. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, we, we, I, I should say Augustine's vision uh, and what, what I think is a biblical vision of this, you know, positive view of freedom, of grace dependence. It is important to realize that it is still actually the graced um, empowering of our agency, right? So it's not a kind of cookie cutterism, or right. it's not just this robotic uh, um, uh, sense of conformity. It's actually the true joy and freedom that comes from finally being given the power to be what you were called to be. And I, I, th I think you want people to see that it shouldn't just look like conformity. It should look like being launched into fullness of humanity. Yeah. Um, a few more questions here with James K.A. Smith, author of On the Road with St. Augustine, A Real World Spirituality for Restless Hearts. I think uh, the listeners can see just how personally challenging and moving uh, your book was. I first heard you speaking on this topic at the Sojourn Network conference, and I hadn't yet read the book. I knew, of course, I've, I've known a lot about your writings for a long time, but this one just hit me in mm -hmm. an especially personal way. And you asked this thought-provoking question, what do we want when we want attention? And I don't know if it's just because I'm a podcaster, writer, all that sort of stuff with Google Analytics open on my laptop at all times. <laughs> right. Um, but how does Augustine help us turn um, that question and to find an answer in Christ? Yeah, uh, this is uh, this was, I would say, one of my um, most important journeys with Augustine on this question too, of our ambition and our ambition for attention. And I think you're right that it is, this is a, a obviously a, a specially pertinent question for people who have sort of public roles, leadership roles to play. And what, what I love about Augustine is um, he's so honest <laughs> about how mixed his motives are. <laughs> so, so on the yeah. one hand, um, you know, he's critical of disordered ambition, um, where I want to be seen and imagine being seen will make me happy, right? Like that's, that's where I get suckered, uh, by the enemy is imagining if I just increase my attention, if I just make this Amazon ranking, ah, I'll finally be happy. And, and Augustine says, look, it doesn't matter what benchmark you set. If that's your yeah. aim, you will always be disappointed. Yeah. Um, whereas if I'm, 
if my ambition, and he doesn't demonize ambition per se, he says, if I'm ambitious because I want to use my gifts for the sake of bearing God's mission in the world, um, then I can actually live out an ambition, which even gives me the freedom to fail because I know my father loves me not right. because of my performance, but because his love makes it possible for me to perform. And then I think my favorite um, part of Augustine's honesty is he says, um, am I doing this for God's attention or your attention? And his answer is yes. <laughs> right? Like he, mm, he just yeah. owns up to the conflictedness. Right. That's back to the spiritual realism yes. that we were talking about. And I think that is more liberating than imagining I could ever be rid of yeah. my, my weakness for uh the praise of men and and um i find it more liberating to live into the confession and god's absolution on that matter um i um i mean this is maybe not as applicable to all the people who are going to be listening here but it's just an application of this it's amazing to me of whatever professional benchmark i reach and of course doing all of this for the sake of jesus mm -hmm. in ministry yeah that whatever is out there in front of me that I think is finally going to make me feel like I arrive, I get there. And then there's a moment that lasts, oh, maybe a few minutes, maybe a few hours. Maybe I go out to eat or something like that. <laughs> and then it's done. Yeah. Yeah. And then it just resets. So, you know, whether it's a, a podcast ranking or a, a benchmark of the number of users on a website or, you know, a, a book, you know, like you said, an Amazon ranking, it just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like they say, uh, just proverbially, there's always somebody wealthier than you. Yes. Yeah, there's always right. somebody smarter yeah. than you yeah. out there. So, again, yeah. Augustine's yeah. Uh, Christ word focus, focus and grace focus is uh, so wonderful. Mm. Um, another area that is challenging, especially with a lot of this uh, focus on autonomy and choice is friendship. Mm. And. I've been trying to figure out a way of how would I describe our functional view of friendship today? Mm -hmm. And I think it's basically just folks we entertain ourselves alongside. That's about as far as that's about that's what I can good. come up with. Yeah, that's there. pretty good. Uh, but you write that a friend is not an enabler. Love doesn't always look like agreement. Mm -hmm. How do we get to this more fulsome view of friendship? that Augustine holds out for us. <sighs> yeah. Um, well, it's going to happen for starters in real proximate embodied lived communities and not yeah. in our incessant, uh, online presences. And, and, yeah. um, uh, I also think, you know, the older I get, the more I realize, um, such friendship takes a lot of work and it takes time. Do you know yes. what I mean? Like you don't, you don't yes. just sort of say, Hey, you know what? Starting Monday, let's be friends uh, <laughs> in this deep way. And let's, you know, and we're going to, since we're going to meet every Tuesday morning and we've made the decision, <laughs> we'll have that kind of friend. There's no, so there's not a formula to it, right? It's actually right. comes with the messiness of lives lived in proximity through thick and thin. Now um, I do think we can make commitments to keep putting ourselves in the way of such relationality. Do you know what I mean? Right. So I also don't yes. think, I don't think you're ever going to get to that depth of friendship if you're never together, right? Or never. And yes. so, um, you know, my, my wife and I have, have uh, enjoyed a, a little practice with the uh, dearest friends of ours that we call Wednesday night wine. I don't know how this will go over with gospel. Now. Let's <laughs> and uh, so every week, Every Wednesday, even if we do it on a Thursday, we still call it Wednesday at Wine. But for like 15 years, we just mm -hmm. are like, okay, we're going to, after they put their kids to bed, we're just going to sit around a table. We have one glass and we just talk and we keep a journal too, actually, of how we, yeah. and I, I do think everybody needs to just think about concrete practices. Sunday morning is yeah. not going to be enough. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's quite the same as small group, but think about concrete practices so that you can at least put yourself in the way for a friendship to become something like that and to live with uncomfortableness, to live with discomfort. I actually think is a virtue of such a friendship. Hmm. 
Well, tell me more about that discomfort. What is it? What yeah, do you mean? So, I, mean it, uh, I think you're right. I, your, your earlier definition of friendship is if yeah. we construe friendship instrumentally like that, I stick with the friendship just to the extent that, right. um, oh, this is fun. This is working. This is something I want to do yeah. as opposed to uh, a friendship in which you confront me or I right. confront you or you're going through uh, you know, the valley of the shadow of death in your family and i'm like i'm not really so no 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 i will be there and you'll i know that you would be alongside me so i i think such friendship only is probably most forged in the hardest of times which will be both suffering but also disappointment and and working through those things and realizing that they're just that's part of a friendship you know i would always get nervous about this friendship that never experiences those things because i don't think it's ever really tested its depth yeah, I, I think something clicked for me a number of years ago when I realized there's no relationship that's truly, deeply important to me where I haven't been very angry at yeah. that person yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Because if they're not angry at me, they don't know me. I think that's right. I think that's exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Yes, yes, yes. yes yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> shout out to all my friends and family. Listening. <laughs> all right. One, um, one last question I have here. You differentiate between posture and and doctrine in explaining Augustine's attraction to the Manichaeans. Mm. I see that Mm. problem everywhere Mm. today, that Mm. posture and doctrine. How can we escape this fascination with what you describe as an explanatory power and associating with tribes Mm. that we want to join? It just, again, something had clicked with me years ago when I realized this fight about theology isn't about theology at all. Mm-hmm. It's about tribes. And mm-hmm. It's about posture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and when Augustine was attracted to this sect called the Manichaeans, they they were the purveyors of enlightenment. They thought they were kind of the rationalists of their day, and so what he was really looking for was association with the smart crowd. Do you know what I mean? And being sort of. Uh, um, and and what he discovered when he got there is actually their answers were not great. Like when he actually tested the answers, he's like, ah, this doesn't work. So maybe maybe people do have to go through um, the disappointment of realizing that those who claim to have the secret and know what everybody else doesn't know, you do have to be actually curious enough to keep pressing those buttons and say, does this really work? And that, that requires some intellectual integrity that I, I'm not sure that comes naturally to us, especially in our cultural moment where I think association is more important than insight. Um, But I think what Augustine um, realized, uh, the other side of it was actually embracing humility, right? So there's, there's a sense in which Augustine also had to come to grips with the limits of what he could know and and how fundamental trust was in that regard and um now does he have a recipe for us breaking out of our echo chambers um i'm not sure i don't it's not it's not immediately obvious to me other than you see i i you'll notice in the book i often look at the dynamics of addiction and recovery as a kind of parallel of how augustine thinks rightly ordered love works and of course Oftentimes, sadly, the way out of our addictions is right. bottoming out and, right. and the crisis yeah. point. And may, maybe one of Augustine's words to us is, don't be worried or frightened if a culture reaches its crisis point. Don't feel like you have to wall yourself off in, in protection. Be there for yeah. them in the crisis point, because that's the opening. That's that's the moment where uh, the inbreaking could happen. Yeah, little heavy dose of uh, city of God, yes. right there. Yes, right, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, and and maybe maybe for me, uh, I mean, Augustine's processing this through the sort of decadence or collapse, whatever mm-hmm. you might want to say, of the, of the late Roman Empire, and um, and I, and I think. A lot of what we've seen politically in our day and a lot of what we've seen then and and changing tribes and and uh, differing associations and things like that. I think for me, that's what that's done. Yeah. Is all of a sudden issues that I thought were so clear 
were suddenly not so clear at all. And I felt like, I, I don't think I changed, but it seems like a lot of other people changed there. But I guess I just wasn't really on the same page. What I thought we were together in a certain way theologically, but then all of a sudden that didn't seem to be very important anymore. And so for me, something of that bottoming out has to do with losing associations mm, mm. because I didn't realize what the association was premised. Interesting. Upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I think you're right. By the way, that was one of the sort of uh, uh, impulses for writing the book is I do think there's really remarkable cultural parallels between Augustine's late ancient you know, uh, end of the Roman Empire context and our own. I don't want to overstate that, but I do think there's a kind of fractious, fraught, cultural boil that he was living in. And uh, it will feel familiar, I think, to people today. Yeah, we uh, we don't know what's next, but we sense that this is winding down. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Which is then why Augustine's. This is where I think Augustine's eschatological word, word is so significant, which is the fundamental base note is yes. hope, hope, right? And right. Which, is, which is not confidence, which is not optimism, but it is still a fundamental hope because you sort of, well, you know where home is and, right. and you're, you're indexed to the North Star and you're, you're kind of unsurprised by anything in the meantime. Well, that's a good way to end it there, because I should clarify what I said earlier. We do know what's come, what comes next sure. as Christians, sure, and that give, fills us with hope. But the disordered love or the disordered hope would to be invest whatever's next culturally or politically yeah. uh, with that kind of yeah. uh, with that kind of hope. In so, time, right. Right. My guest on Gospel Bound, James K.A. Smith, On the Road with St. Augustine is his book, A Real World Spirituality for Restless Hearts. I think it's safe to say, Jamie, I could have kept talking for hours. But, yeah, this was uh, great fun. We could have chatted forever. Thanks for your and thank you. Thank, thanks for taking the time. And also thanks for um, helping to inspire my interest in Charles Taylor as well, which helped me to work on um, the book, Our Secular Age. And um, I'm just grateful for people out there who are, uh, well, especially you who is pushing us in these directions. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Great to chat with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Gospel Bound with Colin Hansen. Join us next time as we continue the search for firm faith in an anxious age. Visit tgc.org slash gospel bound to find transcripts and past episodes. Subscribe to my newsletter and suggest a guest or topic that will help you find hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ.